Pop Talk and Aliens, the William Clear Podcast. Let her voice ring true as usual. I am William Clear. This is Pop Talk and Aliens, and it is a podcast, and we're going to talk about aliens in this episode, or possibly aliens, at least a situation that may have involved extraterrestrial craft of some kind. Unknown craft, that's for damn sure. The Battle of Los Angeles in 1942, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid. Not to be confused with, and no relation to, the movie called The Battle of Los Angeles, which is in fact about alien spaceships and a ragtag group of survivors that fight the aliens off and save the world. Horrible piece of shit has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about happened in 1942, is still somewhat of a mystery to this day, still debated, still talked about, and we will talk about it. But before we do so, let me remind you that Pop Talk and Aliens is brought to you by Audible. Audible is the world's leading provider of audiobooks. They even have original content, over 200,000 titles to choose from, and you can check out Audible for free for 30 days and get a free audiobook by going to this special link just for you, audibletrial.com slash Pop Talk and Aliens. That's audibletrial.com slash Pop Talk and Aliens. Try out the app. It works on your phone, your computer, your mobile device, whatever it is. If it's hooked up to the internet and it can use apps, then it can get Audible. You can play it through your Amazon Echo uh, and so on and so forth. It is a fantastic app. Highly recommend it. And, and try it for free. It's free. So in order to set the stage for our story of the Battle of Los Angeles, let's let's think about this. I don't like to date the podcasts because, you know, like I said, the, uh, the human alien battle is still being downloaded today. And that was recorded in 2017. So I don't like to make these too timely. But I do have to say that as of the time I'm recording this, it's January of 2020. And there are some tensions, some tensions in the world on an international stage uh, between the U.S. and Iran. A lot of goings on, a little back and forth. People are wondering, you know, is there a chance we might go to war? A little bit of tension. A little bit. And if you go back, say, to 9-11, when we were attacked on our own soil, tension was palpable. It was, it was incredible. I mean, people were scared, literally scared. I was scared. I, I remember going on September 13th of that year to San Diego and, you know, San Diego's a military town, and there were all these flags at half-mast. It's very patriotic. But it was also a little bit daunting, a little bit scary, thinking, yeah, I don't know, what if this place is attacked? Who knows at this point? Sleeper cells being activated throughout the U.S. Who knows what could happen? I mean, they even canceled all the baseball games. And, and the pretense for that was, well, it'd be insulting to have guys running around bases and catching balls with gloves after the tragedy that's occurred, which was partially true. The other part was that they did not want crowds of 40,000 people in one place at one time during a period of time where they weren't exactly sure what the fuck was going on and what might happen next. So you, you don't really hear that, but that is very true because if that wasn't true, it contradicts everything else that they said at the time, which was, hey, uh, you know, if you don't go shopping and don't live your regular lives, then the terrorists win. Except baseball, don't go to baseball. So a lot of the baseball thing, it was because they did not want people in huge crowds. So people were scared, and rightfully so. I mean, think about it. 3,000 human beings, not just American, 3,000 human beings dead on American soil from an attack from a foreign entity. Scary. But multiply that and go back to February of 1942 when we were actually at war because we had been attacked, not just by planes flown by fucking freaks that learned uh, how to fly at some weird school. We were being attacked. We were attacked by the Japanese military. The Japanese Air Force attacked us on our own soil and decimated a major military base wiping out a ton of important naval assets that we had. And the next day, we declared war. So we are, we are at war. December 7th, 1941, obviously a day that lives in infamy. And we declared war the next day. And after that, particularly on the West Coast, there were jittery fingers. Jittery fingers, 
itchy trigger fingers. Uh, Japanese submarines were said to have been patrolling the, the western seaboard of our United States. As a result, understandably, there were military personnel here on the, I'm on the west coast. So here, when I say here on the west coast, that's because I'm here. Here on the west coast, uh, they were firing at whales, driftwood, shit like that in the sea. Because if something, you know, something bobs up out of the water, it might be a fucking submarine. And they were right. Might have been, because there were. And on February 23rd, 1942, a Japanese submarine attacked an oil refinery on the west coast near Los Angeles called Elwood. And they didn't kill anyone. There wasn't a ton of damage. And we did fire back at, you know, this submarine or the location of where we thought the submarine was for about 20 minutes. Uh, No dice, no exploding submarine in the ocean, but it showed that Japan could not only just attack us on an island that is part of the United States, but the actual continental United States. After that occurrence, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, now we we don't have a Secretary of War now, thankfully, because it would kind of be a dead giveaway. Like I was talking about the Iran tensions, like if there's, you know, something where they said, and now the Secretary of War is going to speak, I think it would be kind of a a giveaway that we were going to war. But in 1942, we were at war, so it stands to reason that we would have a Secretary of it. And that man was named Henry Stimson. And he came out and said, after this submarine attacked this oil refinery, be prepared, because there may be other attacks. The stock market went to shit. There were blackouts, people were afraid, and over the next uh, several hours throughout the day, things kind of calmed down. We went back to, uh, I think Code White was the the, uh, status of like, you know, things are okay for now. But then, late in the evening of the 24th, slash early in the morning of the 25th, three radars picked up an object about 120 miles off the coast of L.A., floating towards the City of Angels. Numerous eyewitnesses reported a large, lozenge-shaped object floating in the same direction. Now, why they picked lozenge to describe the shape, that's probably because of the 40s. I mean, do we even have lozenges anymore? I guess we do. I don't think that, but I can't imagine anyone would use that as a measure of shape in 2020, but whatever, it doesn't matter. They said lozenges, it's fine. That's what it was shaped like. It was shaped like a lozenge and it was floating towards Los Angeles. Now, radar, as I said, picked up the something floating as well. And radar at the time though, was uh, as described by the military, was wildly inefficient. It was very new. So they didn't necessarily trust what was coming up on, on radar but there were people were were calling in, were calling into you know government offices saying, for for the love of God, we're being attacked. There's some sort of blimp, there's some sort of spaceship, there's some sort of something. It's a Japanese bomber. It's whatever it is. You know the accounts of what this thing was vary wildly throughout the eyewitnesses. Now some say there were tens of thousands of eyewitnesses. Some say that there were two hundred thousand or whatever. Let's just say for the sake of this story, let's 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 assume exaggeration as there usually is. Let's just say thousands. Thousands of people that reported specifically this lozenge floating through the, the air. One of the witnesses said uh, specifically this was a, a woman air raid warden. She said the object was huge. It was really enormous. Stop it. Stop it. I know what you're thinking. Just clean it up. Clean it up. Start over. And I quote, the object was huge. It was really enormous. It was practically hovering right over my house. I had never seen anything like it in my life. It was just hovering in the sky. It hardly moved at all. It looked like a lovely pale orange and was about the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. And I could see it very good because it was really close. It was enormous. Another witness said, I will never forget what a magnificent sight it was, just gorgeous, and what beautiful colors. And that's important because not only was it reported, you know, by people as as this lozenge-shaped thing, it was also reported by many to have an orange hue around it. 
an orange color. Some people even said it was like a, a giant pumpkin floating through the space. But one thing that was agreed upon was that it was enormous. Now, the military, considering everything that was happening, very understandably, was not going to waste a minute of fucking time. They got their surface-to-air artillery prepared. They put up searchlights to try and find whatever this thing was or things, because people also reported multiple things, and blow the fucking shit out of the sky, whatever it is. So the searchlights were up. Things were ready. They had their gunnery prepared. And uh, the officer in charge said, you're at code green, which meant, fire away, boys. Because that's how they talked in the 40s. Fire away, boys. And they did. They started firing into the sky at nothing that they could see for well over an hour. And let me tell you something very important that's going to come up later. They were firing 50 caliber rounds into the sky. Now, I am not a firearms guy. I, I don't know much about it. I don't know, you know, outside of my experience with Call of Duty, I don't really know what kind of bullets and stuff do what. So I did some research and I saw someone demonstrate what a, a 50 caliber round can do. And this guy showed, this was, this was on YouTube, he shot this 50 caliber through, from a, a long distance, from very far away, shot it through a steel plate, through a watermelon, and into a concrete brick, which it fucking annihilated and turned into a pile of rocks. Through a steel plate, through a watermelon, into a concrete block, pile of rocks. Important to remember. Because they fired, over the course of over an hour, 1,400 rounds of these things into the sky. Now, what happened, as one would think, the more of these things that you fire, the more smoke there is. So the, the sky, where their searchlights were, became completely filled with smoke. So not only could they not see anything prior, now also keep in mind, Obviously, the city was blacked out. The entire West Coast was blacked out as soon as they saw this fucking lozenge or spaceships or airplanes or whatever they were flying into Los Angeles. They blacked out the entire West Coast. So the only lights basically on the West Coast are these fucking searchlights and there's smoke surrounding them. So they're firing into these plumes of smoke, not knowing exactly what they're firing at. Some people said that they saw 200 jets. Some people said that they saw up to 15 jets. Some people said they saw two jets. One person said that they saw a jet crash into Hollywood Boulevard. This was later debunked when there was no crash jet on Hollywood Boulevard. There were also reports of other downed uh, military aircraft that were not downed and didn't exist anywhere. Nothing, nothing fell out of the sky except the shells from this artillery that they were firing, which you would think killed a lot of people, right? Turns out, though, only five deaths. Only five deaths of people in the area of this uh, defense of our country died. A couple of them were from heart attacks, a couple of car accidents, but that was it. Uh, there were some injuries from uh, military guys that were, you know, climbing up scaffoldings and setting up the the, uh, the artillery and everything, and you know all the shits going on, and there's bullets flying everywhere, and they got hurt, but it was they, they were fine. They didn't die. Only the five deaths. People freaking out and having heart attacks and freaking out and running into each other on the on the roads. So that is the battle part of it. Now again, we have lozenge shaped blimp slash don't know what. We have 200 fighter planes. We have 15 fighter planes. We have one fighter plane crashing into the boulevard. We have other fighter planes crashing uh, other places. Nothing crashed. Nothing fell out of the sky. As the smoke literally cleared, we got even more wildly conflicting reports. And the problem with the conflicting reports is that it wasn't just like, you know, say Roswell or something where it's the eyewitnesses and the military. That's it, right? These two conflicting stories. The army had an account. The Navy had an account, bystanders and witnesses had an account, and none of them added up. None of them added up. 
I mentioned the two down planes. Now, that was reported by the fuzz police. Anyway, the, the police, a policeman reported that there were two down planes. And the local police investigated that, and, you know, there were no two planes. Now, the Western Defense Command said no planes were shot down, no bombs were dropped, nothing. The Secretary of the Navy, a guy named Billy Knox, actually his name was William, or he went by William Knox. William Knox said, uh, Secretary of the Navy said, it was just a false alarm. There were no planes over Los Angeles last night. At least that's our understanding. His idea was that it was jittery nerves. It was like, just like the shooting of the whales, the shooting of the driftwood. People were panicking, and that's what caused this whole craze. But the Secretary of War, previously mentioned Henry Stimson, said differently. He said, quote, As many as 15 planes may have been involved flying at various speeds from what is officially reported as being very slow to as much as 200 miles an hour, and at an elevation of from 9,000 to 18,000 feet. So 15 planes for him, no planes for Billy Knox, and uh, two planes for the fuzz. Actually, no planes from the fuzz, just that one cop said that there were planes. Then we have our eyewitnesses with their lozenge-shaped object floating very slowly and hovering, some say, over the firing that was being done. One uh, quote is uh, from an eyewitness that said it was surreal, a hanging magic lantern. And it was like the 4th of July, but so much louder. The military was shooting like crazy on it, but they couldn't deal any damage. Some of the media, for for reasons I, I don't understand through my research, decided to go ahead and run with the fact that it was a blimp. And they just reported that straight up, such as, uh, let's listen to this guy, this radio announcer. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. Army officials declined to comment on the possibility that the object might have been a blimp. Guy's so obsessed with it being a blimp. We we saw the witness testimony. I don't even see a mention of a blimp, and I'm sure somebody called it that, but this guy is like really running with that. I got another clip of that guy. It's a... he actually went down to the military station to investigate more uh, more blimp stuff. And here's here, let me roll that. Uh, excuse me, sir. I'm from the official Los Angeles radio station. I remember we saw uh, we had a blimp last night. Can you confirm or deny that it was a blimp? Uh, I don't know, sir. I don't know what it was. I can't confirm or deny anything. Well, are you sure it wasn't a blimp? Uh, there's a lot of things it could have been. A blimp? Uh, I n- n- no confirming or denying at this point. Please leave. So yeah, that was that, that was exclusive to Pop Talking Aliens. That that clip has never been played before. Uh, however, speaking of things that we have heard before, it now comes that time in the show in which I must say those two words that I say more than I say aliens and UFOs. And those two words are, of course, weather balloon. That is weather balloon, because of course, one of the excuses, one of the reasons given, one of the objects that it should have been or could have been or was, was a weather balloon. And fast forward in time, 40 years or so, actually almost exactly 40 years, in 1983, the official word from the government was given that it was in fact a weather balloon that these guys were were shooting at. And let me remind you of what I told you about the artillery they were using through a steel plate, through a watermelon, and annihilating a cement Brick. 1,400 rounds of that couldn't take down a weather balloon that was supposedly hovering directly above the searchlights. And and that is where the UFO conspiracy comes in. And before we get there, I have to tell you a little more about this weather balloon thing because the uh, United States Coast Artillery Association came out with a comic book in 1949, where they described the weather balloon. It's actually not a comic book at all, uh, but it looks like a comic book. This was published in 1949. There's an article written by a guy named Colonel John G. Murphy. And uh, he wrote about the Battle of Los Angeles. And at some point, he comes to this. And I'll read this to you. There were no enemy air attacks on the West Coast. There were two submarines attacking, uh, which attacked by gunfire, 
one on Fort Stevens, Oregon, and some oil docks north of Los Angeles. I apologize for his bad grammar. It is not my misreading. However, there were many alerts, many blackouts, many alarms, and the anti-aircraft troops were always in a pertinent condition of readiness. Prior to the Battle of Midway, there was a distinct tenseness all along the West Coast. We believed that the Jap would attack Midway, but we also believed that he could change his plan, he being the Jap, <laughs> could change his plans and attack any of the important cities of the West Coast. Troops during this period were ready for any action. They were always ready for action, albeit sometimes over-ready or maybe even gullible. As was shown by the famous Battle of Los Angeles on February 26, 1942. He got the fucking date wrong, this comic book author. Uh, the author, he, I guess he, he means him, was on a staff visit to the 37th Brigade. Sometime after midnight, I was awakened by the sound of gunfire. A uh, quick glance through, okay, it didn't start until 3 a.m., but that's fine. It was He has the wrong date and the wrong time, but that's okay. Uh, a quick glance through the window was not productive of any enlightening information. A quick trip to the roof of the hotel brought reward for the upward toil. Oh my God. Okay. So this guy, uh, this Colonel is writing uh, incorrect facts about this event and trying to sound like F Scott Fitzgerald while he does it. So uh, let's just, there's a little bit more of this to, to go that, and then we'll, we'll get away from this guy's uh, prose. A quick glance through the window is not productive of any enlightening information. A quick trip to the roof of the hotel brought reward for the upward toil. It was a beautiful moonlit night, but the moon's magnificent was, magnificence was dwarfed by the brilliant glare of 90s and 3-inch spewing fire to the heavens. This is I'm reading it verbatim, okay? The glare and the noise of the bursting shells, the delicate sky tracery of red and green, 40 millimeters and 50 calibers arching lazily through the skies and the brilliant incandescence of the searchlights probing the heavens hither and yon, up and down. A beautiful picture, a grand show. But at what were they firing? Imagination could easily have disclosed many shapes in the sky in the midst of this weird symphony of noise and color. But cold detachment disclosed no planes of any type were in the sky, friendly or enemy. And suddenly all was quiet, and only the light of the moon relieved the grim picture of a city in total blackout. I lingered on the roof, ruminated on what this was all about, and was idly wondering if I could find my way to the brigade headquarters throughout the blackout when all hell broke loose again. A cacophony, a cacophony of sound and glaring brilliance again pervaded all. But soon it was over, and quiet and darkness again descended on the awakened day. On my way to the brigade headquarters next morning, screaming headlines in the morning papers told of the many Jap planes that were brought down in flames. At brigade headquarters, there was much gloom. No one knew exactly what had happened. Major General Jacob Fickle and Colonel Samuel Kepner flew down from San Francisco and with the writer <laughs> constituted a board, I guess he means himself again, to investigate the firing. We interrogated approximately 60 witnesses, civilians, Interrogated them. Nice. This guy even fucking admit. This is my favorite author ever on Pop Talk and Aliens. Uh, Army, Navy, and Air commissioned and enlisted personnel. All right. So, but you get a good idea of what you know. What I just talked about, told by a, a, a guy who thinks he's some sort of Pulitzer Prize winning author. Let's get to the part where he talks about it being a weather balloon. Now, again, this was written in 1949 by this colonel who supposedly eyewitnessed. You know. He, went to the top of his hotel and was rewarded with a cacophony and symphonic blast of air raid sirens, all that bullshit that he was saying. But he concludes that it was a weather balloon in 1949, years before the actual official government saying that it was a weather balloon. This guy, comic book guy, said that it was a weather balloon. And uh, he, says it, he says it this way. Well, after all these years, the true story can be told. One of the AA regiments, we still had regiments, sent up a meteorological balloon about 1 a.m. That was the balloon that started all the shooting. Now, let me just go back and be a little nitpicky and say that he was awoken just after midnight to the sound of all the firing, and here he says that the weather balloon wasn't even released until 1 a.m., plus he got the date wrong. Just saying. That was the balloon that started all the shooting. 
When quiet had settled down on the embattled, quote, city of Los Angeles, a different regiment, alert and energetic as always, decided Met data was needed. And he put Mets in quotes. I don't know what that means. Neither do you. You probably do. You're smarter than me. Uh, felt it had not done so well in the battle and thought a few weather corrections might help, so they sent up a balloon and hell broke loose. Again, note both balloons, as I remember, floated away majestically and safely. Now, uh, that is part of his ridiculous writing that I skipped. He did say that the the balloon that he saw floated away majestically and safely. So that's also what uh, eyewitnesses said. The, the lozenge people, they also said that this thing, you know, floated slowly over and it just hovered over that attack for a while and it just kept going. Most people said uh, headed towards, the, you know, the direction of Mexico. So again, this thing withstood However many rounds, you know, they fired 1,400 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. Who knows how many actually hit this thing and didn't pop it. Uh, but nevertheless, eyewitnesses and F. Scott Fitzgerald, Colonel F. Scott Fitzgerald here, said that once all the smoke had cleared, the thing just kept flying majestically on, uh, as he says. So... Uh, He then says, the inhabitants of Los Angeles felt very happy. They had visual assurance that they were well protected and the AA gunners were happy. They had fired more rounds than they would have been authorized to fire in 10 peacetime years. Many changes in units and personnel occurred. uh, And then he goes on about Pearl Harbor. Okay. So he says that he woke up on the date that it didn't happen at a time that it didn't happen And then he goes on about cacophony this and symphony that and how his toil up the hotel stairs was rewarded. Let me tell you something. This guy, according to this thing, is a colonel or a retired colonel. Him walking up hotel stairs is not a toil. Now, if my fat ass has to walk up hotel stairs, that is a toil. That is toiling. And yes, I better be rewarded with a cacophony of sound and a a symphony of lights. Now, the, the reason I read from this guy is because from everything I found, he is the only you know, so-called witness that wrote extensively about it. And when I say so-called witness, it's because he was apparently there at the wrong time and on the wrong day. But nevertheless, we'll forgive him that and assume that he's not lying and that he was there and he did witness all of this. He's the only person who claims that there was a second barrage of fire and a second balloon quote unquote, second object. It's important that we know about that second balloon slash object report. And it's nowhere else. It's I, I just could not find it anywhere else. And believe me, out of respect for you, my dear audience, I do not skimp on the research. Okay, if I see one thing, try to corroborate it somewhere else. But apparently just this guy is is the person who saw two balloons. The other thing that I find interesting too in his writing is that he uses the word interrogate. We interrogated 60 civilians who saw the lozenge or whatever they saw. And, you know, based on the way this guy writes, he certainly fancies himself some sort of commandant of the King's English. So one would assume that he knows what the word interrogate means by strict definition. And what that is, is according to the Cambridge Dictionary, which he is, of course, familiar with. Interrogate is to ask someone many questions in a formal situation. In a forceful way that can be seen as threatening. So maybe he just didn't read the second part the way he didn't bother to check his calendar to see when he was uh, there watching this whole thing unfold from the comfort of his hotel room and his hotel roof which he toiled up to get to. The third reason, uh, the second reason I, I, I wanted to read that is because it's hilarious. And the third reason is because it's one of the things that is sourced on Wikipedia. And I do not use Wikipedia to research UFO articles and stories for this podcast. I don't use Wikipedia because for one thing, I don't want someone else's interpretation and I don't want to sit here and read you a Wikipedia page. The idea of me telling you the stories is that you're going to get more than you'd get on Wikipedia. And the other thing is that they they always take the official party line, no matter what it is. Any sort of UFO occurrence, whatever the excuse or reason or official reason or 
a statement is at the end, that is where Wikipedia closes the book. But they do have interesting source material at times. So I will always go check Wikipedia for whenever these subjects come up and go straight down to the source material. And in that source material, I found this article, this comic book, whatever it is. It's up. I will put a picture of this thing on our uh, Facebook page and our brand new Instagram page so that you can see it and you can see why it, you know, to me, looks like a comic book. You know, along with all this flowery English that he uses, he throws in the Jap. Like, I know that that's how they talked back then. And, you know, certainly they didn't have the kind of filters that uh, we know today. However, calling the enemy the Jap and, and things like that was that's kind of reserved for like the, the bunker and, uh, you know, maybe the uh, the generals and stuff and, and the general public. But this guy coming out to write this uh, this masterpiece, y- you think he'd refer to them as the enemy or something. But I, I don't know I, enough about this guy. He said what he needed to say, and I've read what I have needed to read. But just one last thing on the actual Wikipedia article about Battle of Los Angeles. Guess how many sentences are devoted to the UFO aspect of this? Three. And one of them is about that movie. So two, there's two sentences about UFO, UFOs, and then there's a reference to that stupid movie being made. Apparently also the movie 1941, the Spielberg, uh, I think John Belushi movie also has to do with the Battle of Los Angeles. I saw it maybe when I was seven or something, I don't remember, but apparently that also has something to do with this. Anyway, let's talk about the UFO part in more than two sentences, because there are more than two sentences to go around when it comes to this aspect of the Battle of Los Angeles. Now, we've gone to the weather balloon story. We've talked about all the planes that weren't there. It's important to also know that the Japanese, years later, when we were friends, we told them all the stuff that we did. They told us all the stuff that they did. And they told us things that they did, like bombing a fucking picnic in Oregon. And they swore up and down, no, we didn't fly anything over on February 26th, 1942. So there's really, there was no reason for them to lie about that because they told us that they bombed it. I mean, they didn't bomb a picnic specifically, but they, they attacked the West Coast again and some picnickers died in, in Oregon. So they admitted to that. And they admitted to other things, but, you know, obviously they would have copped to, yeah, we flew a couple of planes over that night after we blew up your oil refinery the the night before. It would have been no big deal. But they said, no, we did not do that. Nothing to do with us. So that's one reason that that, uh, people get suspicious. The second is the obvious fact that, as I've said 10 times already, a fucking weather balloon wasn't popped by the artillery that was being fired at it. It's called anti-aircraft artillery. (laughs) A balloon scarcely qualifies as aircraft to begin with, and we can't shoot it down with that. So that's number two. Now, number three, there was a photo published in the LA Times on the 26th, the day after the attack. And that photo had been retouched from the original photo that they, they took that night. And that has caused much speculation in the UFO community as to what exactly the reason was for them to touch that up. And there was an article uh, written about that in that same paper, the LA Times, just recently in 2017. And I will read you what they had to say about their own retouched photo. They say, quote, this is from LA Times in 2017. On February 26, 1942, the LA Times published a photo page that included a retouched version of the searchlight photo and seven other images. The retouch version is the iconic image seen worldwide. You've probably seen that picture. It's a bunch of spotlights pointing into the sky and the bullets are flying up. Uh, We'll post that too. Back in 2011, I viewed the two negatives. The non-retouch negative is very flat. The focus is soft and it looks underexposed, although I could not tell if the negative was the original or a copy negative made from a print. It definitely showed the original scene before a print was retouched. The second negative is a copy negative from a retouched print. 
Such details, such as the white spots around the searchlight's convergence, are exactly the same in both negatives. In the retouch version, many light beams were lightened and widened with white paint, while other beams were eliminated. In the 1940s, it was common for, news for newspapers to use artists to retouch images uh, because of poor reproduction. The retouching was needed to reproduce this image, but I wish the retouching had been more faithful to the original. Then he goes on to say, The Los Angeles Times published another retouch version of this image on October 29, 1945. The white spots near the convergence of the searchlights are larger than in the 1942 version. This print in the Los Angeles Times library is in poor condition. Additional images are in the March 9th, 1942 Life magazine. On page 22 is another photograph of searchlights from the night of the Battle of LA. And on page 19 is a story of the Japanese submarine attack on February 23rd that we talked about. Okay, so many ufologists and UFO enthusiasts have asked the question as to why they needed to touch up the first one. And this guy says, well, it's because the, the first picture was, was poor. But why to such extents using paint and taking out certain lights and widening other lights? And other people say it's, it's because they, they fucked with the contrast so that you could not see what was clearly an object hovering above them that they were firing at and having no effect on. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And if you search online, you'll, you can see people that have circled, you know, here's the UFO and things like that. And then the fact that they touched it up again a few years later and, and made more changes has caused rampant speculation. So uh, the, the LA Times photo of the Battle of Los Angeles is always a, a talking point in the UFO community. Now, as for uh, something we talked about earlier from the eyewitnesses, the orange hue, the orange glow, the pumpkin, the most magnificent, enormous thing that woman had ever seen. Stop it. Uh, that was explained by a radar technician who said that the weather balloon, which he concluded that it was, this was also in the forties, had orange flares attached to it. So this gigantic, the biggest thing that these people had seen in their lives, the most majestic, wonderful thing, even one eyewitness said hovered over the <laughs> The, uh, the, the ground when they were firing and was not destroyed was glowing orange. It was uh, another one, as I said, called it, said it looked like a pumpkin. So flares hanging from this thing also doesn't quite add up to why it would have this glow. I mean, maybe, I don't know, the way something would reflect, the light would reflect off the balloon, I guess. But there's also... There's also the question of how fucking big was this weather balloon? That, that that blimp guy insisted that it was a blimp. And some people are saying that it was hovering at 19,000 feet or 8,000 feet, moving very slow, moving very fast. And the one conclusion is that it was not damaged by all this ar ar artillery. And I know that I've said that over and over and over again, but that is the big thing. They didn't shoot down any planes. They didn't shoot down any, any bombers. And they couldn't shoot down a fucking balloon. Now, the other thing that comes into play has to do with the Majestic 12. Now, I'm going to do a whole show about the Majestic 12, probably a two-parter. I've been researching this for a while. It's, it's a conundrum. It's a hell of a story to untie and unbox and unpack. But I'll get to this simple part of it as it relates to the Battle of Los Angeles. So, Majestic 12, in a nutshell, with these... 12 people appointed by Harry Truman, sort of a, an Illuminati-esque group of people, clandestine, to sit behind closed doors and examine everything UFO. In their UFO research, they came to the conclusion that the Battle of Los Angeles was, in fact, aliens. Now, how exactly the Majestic 12 documents came into the hands of civilians and all of that, we'll, we'll get into in its own podcast, but... It was a series of memos and documents and everything, and the one regarding the Battle of Los Angeles was a memo, supposedly written by a guy named General George Marshall, who was the head of the armed forces at the time, to President Roosevelt himself, claiming that the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, which they called it, many called it, 
there were two aircraft that were unconventional and quote unquote not earthly. And get this, they were recovered. Yes, according to this Majestic 12 document, and there are many Majestic 12 documents, it, it well, some might be real, some might not be real, all might be real, all might not be real. It's very hard to, to get through this maze, but we will do that later. I think that there is a, a whole disinformation slash disclosure slash information triangle going on and all of that, but I will get to that later. For now, let's talk about the fact that not only do the so-called Majestic 12 think that those things were not of earthly origin, they recovered them. So I have in front of me a very smeary uh, PDF that's uh, taken from a Majestic 12 document, a, a copy of it. And what I can make out from it is this. Regard, it's written by a guy named George C. Marshall, who was uh, head of the armed forces at the time, and he's writing directly to President Roosevelt. And he writes, this is just a couple weeks after the thing. Uh, regarding the air raid over Los Angeles, it was learned by Army G2 that Rear Admiral Anderson recovered an unidentified airplane off the coast of California with no bearing on conventional explanation. And then there's stuff that is unreadable. This headquarters has come to the determination that the mystery airplanes are in fact not earthly and according to secret intelligence sources, they are in all probability of interplanetary origin. As a and then there's more black stuff. As a consequence, I have issued orders to Army G2 that a special intelligence unit be created to further investigate the phenomenon and report any significant connection between recent incidents and those collected by the Director of the Office of Coordination of Information. And then there's some file number stuff and, and more black stuff. And then uh, it says Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit, which is, is typed on it. So I, I don't know if they recovered both of these things, but they do say that they recovered one craft that was much like the craft that floated over Los Angeles. And if I may be conspiratorial, as is my job, let me say this. Let me make this connection. Bob Lazar, when he talks about having worked at S4, he always says that there were numerous flying saucers. And, you know, one of them may have been the Roswell one. Who knows? His theory, and it is just a theory, as he says, is that they came from some sort of archaeological dig. I have always wondered if there are numerous flying saucers that we have in our possession or have had in our possession or whatever, how we got them. If they recovered one of these things, if this really was a flying saucer and they recovered at least one, possibly two, then you throw in Roswell and then the, you know, the other stories that, that we've talked about and, and will talk about in the future, they start to add up. And then that idea starts to make sense that, you know, slowly but surely we kept recovering these craft and hauling them off to this secret location in Nevada to be examined and reverse engineered and everything. But a lot of people really subscribe to the idea of the Majestic 12. And that memo is one of their many smoking guns. Matter of fact, pretty much everything in the Majestic 12 documents is a smoking gun. It's a pile of smoking guns. There's more smoking guns in the Majestic 12 than there were on the ground firing at the thing in the air in the Battle of Los Angeles. So you put that together with the photo. You put that together with the eyewitness testimony. You put that together with all the inconsistencies. And you got yourself a UFO story, my friend. So that leaves us with an open door, my friends. An open door to speculate about UFOs was just much better than speculating about you-know-what that I talked about earlier in the show. Now, the logical and reasonable question comes up as to what the fuck does a extraterrestrial spacecraft care about what's going on in Los Angeles in 1942? Well, it ties back to a recurring theme that's come up in ufology and on this show many times, which is UFOs spotted near areas that are military, areas that have nuclear capability, Areas where there is possible conflict. This has happened and been reported time and time and time again. Over the years, 
Over 75 high-ranking military officials have reported UFOs over military bases and areas of potential conflict over the years. Now, that's just the reports. 75 of them have just reported that. God knows how many have actually witnessed something like that. And again, high-ranking. People that would understand and be aware of craft that we had developed that might be floating around a place like Roswell or something else, Uh, you know, similar types of military bases. Jesse Marcel in Roswell was a high-ranking intelligence officer who claimed that he was well aware of the technology that we had and, and didn't know what the fuck happened at Roswell. There were other military people at Roswell that said they saw flying discs prior to the actual crash. This has been reported time and time and time again. So, why is it that this happens? Are they, are they monitoring us? Are they trying to prevent something? Are they trying to get in on the action? Do they just want a little bit of the show? Or are they just, is it just a fucking coincidence? Or they're military craft of some, of some kind? My question in this is that if these are all these secret military projects and, and craft that we're unaware of and that these 75 high-ranking officers are unaware of, and Jesse Marcel and everybody are unaware of these military projects that are that just so happen to be hovering over military places and military activity. Why have we never used these things? Why are there never been, at some point, flying discs that we have used in some sort of conflict? We're in 2020. These things have been spotted since fucking the 40s. Why have these things never been used? I mean, you would think that if the government had developed a flying disc that could maneuver in the way that flying discs and flying saucers have always been reported, you think they would have used them by now, that they would have perfected whatever the fuck it was that they were working on, that nobody ever knew what it was, but it was always hovering around military bases. And that may sound like a simplistic question, the question a child might ask, but when it comes to dealing with matters of intergalactic travel and alien species, a human being must ask questions that are simple like that. And I think it's a reasonable question. If flying disks are military craft that have been around for 70 years, you think at some point they would have either shut the project down or in, say, the Gulf War, we would have seen flying saucers flying around. Or in Korea or Vietnam. Well, we got our brand new flying saucers. All the military officials have been wondering what they're seeing. Well, here it is, boys. Get them up in the air and light them up. We got these crazy ass things that can maneuver like a son of a bitch. No, we're still we're still seeing them now. That fucking Tic Tac UFO in San Diego off the coast near a military base. It's a couple years ago. It's a few years ago. We're still seeing these things. So the idea that a UFO might have wanted to check in on what was going on in the West Coast of 1942 when the battles were getting going in World War II, particularly in the the Pacific Theater. It's It's not completely unreasonable to believe that. It's not reasonable, but it's not completely unreasonable. Could it have been a a, a random-ass blimp? I doubt it. Could it have been a weather balloon? I guess. You know, I've, I looked up weather balloons to see why we were always using them so much back then. And it, it makes more sense back in those days because we didn't have the technology we have. But apparently, we still use them today regularly. I've always joked how ridiculous it must be to see a weather balloon. But apparently, they still fly them up at high altitudes once in a while. And apparently, they, they crash and fall all the time, and there are people that are designated to go find them. And that's now. Which again begs the question, if if these things in 2020 are still being used and they're falling to the ground all the time, 1,400 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition were fired at this so-called weather balloon that was hovering above Los Angeles, and it just went on its merry way to Mexico. Completely unaffected by the barrage of artillery fired directly at it. 
And so goes the Battle of Los Angeles. The book has been closed as of 1983. It was a weather balloon. It goes into the stack of conclusions that any flying unidentified craft was in fact a weather balloon. And it goes down into history as such. And it goes down into history as being confused with a shitty fucking sci-fi movie. So I hope you have enjoyed this telling of the story of the Battle of Los Angeles. It's one that I have always enjoyed because it's one that still remains somewhat of a mystery. Even if the probability of a spacecraft from another galaxy is low in this case, it, it is still unsolved, merely with weather balloons stamped on it to, to get it out of the way and get it off someone's fucking desk. Like Rendlesham Forest, like the Phoenix Lights, like Bob Lazar, it goes into the pile of never fully answered. There is doubt, there is wonder, there are questions to be asked about exactly what the fuck happened in the early hours of February 25th, 1942, over the skies of the City of Angels. Cue the hot... You know what? Actually, let's give the last word to Captain Robert Salas of the United States Air Force, retired. Captain? It's hard to imagine that we couldn't have shot a balloon down. Amen, sir. And now, cue the hot chick. Pop Talk and Aliens, the William Clear Podcast.